So um, the part of the timing of this, and, and when we talked about it, is really the idea of um, the benefits of early exercise, and it really fits in. We're going to focus in around about the idea of the neonatal and, and the young foal, and it, and it fits in with what we're doing on the farm at the moment, where we're sort of thinking about, we've, we've weaned perhaps some of the early drafts, and, and some of us are thinking about uh, weaning uh, some of the other horses that we have. And so it helps us sort of think about the idea of developing that nice, solid platform from a musculoskeletal and an athletic point of view going forward. Um, because there's a lot of time and effort that goes into breeding a horse, a lot of emotional investment as well. And we want to really try and be as proactive as we can to try and maximise success rather than sort of, um, sort of um, be reactive and then try and fix up things once we start having a horse into sport. So that's going to be one of the focuses as we go through this, uh, this, this chat and this conversation. So one of the main drivers for why we really think this is important, and it's, it's, it's a, I was going to say it's, an obs it's not quite an obsession of mine, but it's, it's one of those important things that we often think about is when you start talking about horses that enter sport, um, one of the really interesting things is that it doesn't matter whether it's racing or it's dressage or it's show jumping or eventing, we find that it's the same relative proportions that we start to lose um, out of the production cycle. So we sort of really, we roughly talk about the idea of the, the rule of thirds. So um, of the horses that enter sport, we end up losing about a third of those due to musculoskeletal injury. And so that's something that if we look at how we develop the horse and how we grow it and uh, try and set it with a solider platform going forward, we can try and minimize that. And I guess tempering that or, or at the other end is the really, which is quite a scary statistic, is when you talk about the idea of the registra registration life of a horse. So we're saying from the time a horse first enters sport until it is no longer registered. And again, it doesn't matter whether we talk about, and, and I apologize for the Australians, I don't think we've got any data out of Australia yet, but when we look at for, even for racehorses, well, for racehorses, we've got some nice data out of Australia, but racehorses and sport horses, and uh, it doesn't matter whether it's jumpers in France or event horses in England, the average, or the, what we call the median registration life is only four years. So it gives you a bit of an idea that we're actually up against it here. Here we've We've got one third of our horses don't continue because of uh, musculoskeletal injury and the risk of lameness. And then the fact, even with all of that lined up, we actually have a relatively short registration life where we actually, or productive or, or sport life, where we can do things. So we really need to make sure we have that um, really solid, stable platform when we do everything that we can so that when the horse enters sport, that we can make the most of it and that it can continue and uh, be a successful athlete. Now, the, the biggest difficulty that we really have going forward when we start talking about the idea of, well, what should we be doing with horses to try and ensure that we end up with the best athlete that we can? How should we manage them? What is ideal is that we really don't have a gold standard. And we've manipulated what we do with modern management so much that from a management point of view of looking at our management systems, we struggle to say, well, this is ideal and that might not be. So... If we take a step back and then say, okay, what are we going to use as our reference point? Um, feral horses provide perhaps one of the best platform. And we've got some nice data, and, and this is, this, um, I don't know whether the Australians recognise this, is some, some lovely shots of some Brumbies there. And this is some data that came from New South Wales and from Queensland that um, Brian Hampson collected in the early days using GPS collars. And what he found is depending on the resources available, so this depends on the scarcity of resources, so food and water, uh, horses tend to travel around about seven kilometres up to about 18 kilometres a day. But when resources are really tight, they will cover up to 55 kilometres a day. So it gives you a bit of an idea that we've got this quite a large range, but somewhere between seven and 18 kilometres appeared to be normal, looking at that data that we got out of, um, out of Australia. So what does this mean when we start looking at perhaps some of the other data and we start looking at data from Wyoming, some from the Kaimanawa horses, uh, we start to see that the pattern is very similar, but it starts to converge and go, really becomes quite tight around that seven to 15 kilometers per day that those horses are traveling. So we start to get an idea that basic exercise, a horse really wants to be able to walk and to cover somewhere between seven and 15 kilometers a day when resources are adequate.
Now, um, when we talk about the horse, the horse, we use the language, we talk about the horse being a cursorial animal and cursorial basically means it gets up and, and, and it is capable of running. And we've got a lovely example of the wee thoroughbred foal there, smart looking little, little foal. And it's there and it's one of the interesting things with horses is, is they foal, they can stand and they're able of locomotion very, very soon after birth. Now, this translates, this ability to move, translates um, to the ability to cover some significant distances um, as, we, as we progress um, through, through, through the foal's life. So if we look here, this is some data that again, that Brian Hampson collected. And what we have here, if you look at the right hand side of your screen here, are some mares that are given, basically they were in 16 hectare paddocks, so complete opportunity to move as much as they could. And if we look at the amount of movement these pregnant mares were doing, walking around, just fossicking for food, just in a, in a normal management system, they were covering six kilometres a day. Three to nine days after foaling, and we've got the introduction there of EPS units on the foal as well as on the mares, we can see that the mares and the foals were covering similar distances. So within three days of life, those foals are covering seven kilometres per day in that paddock. So just wandering around, this is not forced exercise, they weren't scarce, it wasn't that resources were scarce and they had to find food. This is just normal activity, free activity that they're capable of. And this distance uh, remained at around about seven kilometers when we went to three to five days after foaling. So you can see the story starting to emerge that horses actually really move quite a significant amount of um, distance when they're actually in a paddock. Now, if we look at the left-hand side of your screen there, we have the data that Brian collected when he actually restricted the uh, horses. We restricted horses to different size paddocks. And so we've got right on the far side there, the six by six meter, which is a typical yard. And so that's a horse in a yard. So with the GPS unit on, just the horse moving from one side to the yard and keeping tabs of what it actually covered, it covered about 1.1 kilometers per day. So it's okay, it's something, but it's not a lot. When we went to 0.8 of a hectare, we can see the horses were traveling or covering 4.7 kilometers per day. And then as we increased the size of the paddocks, we started to get a little bit more, more exercise. So in a four hectare paddock, which for us in uh, New Zealand is fairly standard for keeping uh, a lot of our, um, our broodmares and foals in, in paddocks of similar sizes, we see about six kilometers per day there. Then as we move up to 16 hectares, still you know, a couple more kilometers, but we're starting to plateau out really at that seven kilometers per day. And then that 4,000 hectares, that was the, uh, the long range that we had with those feral horses. And you've got to bear in mind, some of that feral horse data, they were scarce resource. So they actually were perhaps looking for uh, some extra feed and having to work a little bit harder than perhaps what we saw with our mares and foals in our domestic pasture but it does give us an idea that we're starting to see that these animals want to move and there is a reason for this. So if we think about modern management systems, we tend to actually constrain rather than encourage activity. And this is one of the interesting sort of challenges that we have is as horses become increasingly valuable, we worry about what uh, happens in the risk of injury. We actually restrict exercise. When if we think about a young foal, we're wanting to develop a platform that grows and creates the correct template so it is able to tolerate those loads and challenges that it's going to meet as an athlete. And that's why the majority of us breed foals. We're breeding an animal to be an athlete. And so we want to set that template. And I guess the analogy that we could use is um, if you were looking to have somebody to win the tennis, uh, if, we, if we get to the, the Tokyo Olympics in 2021, um, you don't start putting yourself out and just say, right, um, we're going to teach you how to play tennis and we're going to condition you. It's a long developmental process that we talk about and it's exactly the same with an equine athlete. Now, if we have a look at this figure here and we can see 0.8 hectares, this is really where most of us sort of sit with most of our horses. And if we use that rough rule of thumb that we had with the mares and the foals with their free exercise, we can see we're probably getting at best two thirds, but really about half the amount of exercise that those animals really naturally want to be acquiring. So the, we probably need to think, can we tweak what we're doing? Is there a better way to do it? Or what is the impact if we do restrict them to those four kilometers per day on their musculoskeletal development and perhaps their potential to succeed in sport later on? Now, for those that are, um, 
are involved in show jumping, you'll probably recognize this term about perfect practice. And it was a great saying by um, George Morris, who used to go on and on and on about perfect practice makes perfect. And really it's this idea that if we think about what horses do and are primed to do, it's primed to set up the musculoskeletal system, it's primed to develop them. And so if we let them do what they're naturally primed to do, we can allow them to develop uh, along the appropriate, appropriate developmental pathways. Now, if we have a look uh, there, we can see the image there is of a, a foal. And this is one of the early, this is some early data that we captured quite a few years ago. And these were GPS units. They were US military grade GPS units. Um, and this, this, this story, I mean, those that rear foals will realize how foals get into things and they're incredibly destructive. But uh, we were assured when we purchased them that there was no way that these foals would be able to destroy them. And uh, there was one little loose wire and within about five minutes, the uh, foals had chewed the wire on every unit. So uh, we became quite good at stripping those apart and rebuilding them. But we were able to collect some really lovely data from this, which was a little bit building on what Brian had done, which was talking about just distance travel. We were able to differentiate basically by the speed and the distances that these animals traveled, what activities were going on. So when they were walking, trotting, cantering, if they were grazing, uh, standing and uh, lying down. And so if we look and start at the, the, the bottom image there of the, the figure there, we've got what we call daytime workload. So that is the distance traveled by the foals in a day multiplied by the speed at which those different activities were done. And we can see that basically the workload when we use this workload index was twice as great in that first month of life than it was in subsequent lives, uh, subsequent, I apologize, subsequent months. And so the question is, why would a foal be doing that? Why would it be providing extra load cycles in those first four weeks? And when we start looking back and thinking about what does a foal do, what actually occurs in that first month, it actually relates to that initiation of play activity, those spontaneous bouts of high speed activity. And we can see that when we started stripping back what we'd collected with regards to the different activities of uh, canter, trot, walk. And you can see that a much higher percentage of the uh, canter activity was what drove that increased workload. And so it was in that first four weeks of life that the foals are doing those high speed bursts, the canter activities, the prongs, um, which are hugely osteoinductive and stimulating to try and set their musculoskeletal system up to say, boy, we're actually going to be doing things, we're going to be here, so you need to respond and be able to tolerate these loads. So this was sort of the first prompt that the idea that the foals know what's, what's best innately they're programmed to do it. And if we can facilitate that, maybe we can head them down the appropriate path and make them better able to cope with the demands of later uh, athletic life. Now, this is some... So, Chris, um, the, um, yeah. Chris, yeah, just going to say that, that 1.09, is that the percentage of time that horse That's spent the at the canter? Time. Yes, at the canter, yeah. So, when you look at a foal over a 24-hour period, yeah. So, uh, and this is one of the really interesting things, and um, it ties in. That's, that's a good prompt, actually, Jonathan, because it ties in with the next thing, is that the... Um, the musculoskeletal system is primed to only have, if you achieve the, the appropriate stimulus at the right threshold, it only needs, we talk about very few load cycles. And the classic example was the, um, what we call the, uh, the turkey wing experiment, which uh, was done by Alan Goodship quite a few years ago, where he immobilized um, the wings on turkeys. And then on the tibia on one, one side, he exposed to only three, 18 cycles. So three to 18 compressions at the appropriate strain, and he was able to increase bone mass in that tibia. So it showed us that we might, might only need only a matter of a number of strides, but at the right um, strain rate for the, um, the bone to respond. And that leads so, to the, yeah? So, so it need, it's needing that concussive effect at that, at that force, yeah, at the canter. at the appropriate strain. And when you look at the way a foal um, exercises next to its mum and, and the way there's, there's almost like a, 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 a cumulative increase in the amount of load that it applies. So when a foal first starts, it does a couple of little, basically almost like a little dance and a prong, and that's the first little load cycle. And then you start to see in the second day as it gets a bit stronger, it starts to introduce a little bit of um, 
basically a couple of strides at canter. But again, it's that same, you know, you see horses when they're playing in the paddock and they'll gallop across the paddock and then slam on the brakes and do that rapid acceleration, deceleration. And we have a, a, a hunch um, that, that, you know, when you see horses playing in the paddock and you think, why would they do that? Because that's the most terrifying thing as a horse owner. But you see your valuable horse you spent all that time uh, working with, then galloping towards the fence line and stopping just within a millimetre of the fence. Um, we think that it might be part of that is pre-programmed to stimulate the bone and, and the musculoskeletal system because rapid acceleration and deceleration creates the appropriate stimulus for uh, the bone to respond. And I'll show you just on the, the next slide here, which is some what we, we called it was some reverse engineering. So what Sorry, we did is we Chris, took some just, data. Yeah. Back on that one, how big was that data set just with the amount? Was it around, is the number of observation, is that the average of how many horses you were tracking? Oh, what do we have? Now you've got me on the spots there, there Mitch. It was probably nearly 15 years ago when we did this. Yeah. Um, I just think we had about 15, 15 Merin foal units on that on that study. Yeah. Okay. So it was, it was a pretty good um, and, and pretty robust time cohort. Um, and we, we've, we've found it to be pretty, well, pretty typical. We think it's fairly typical because the management wasn't, um, wasn't distinctly different from what would happen on a commercial environment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah lovely. Yeah. So with this, this is a little bit of, you know, when we talk about the, the foals and the idea of perfect practice, this is looking at the speed and this is derived from um, a thoroughbred galloping on a treadmill we've then sort of reverse engineered this to try and look at the appropriate strains that a foal would receive when it is trying to do the different activities. So basically, if we look at the, um, we've got speed along the bottom there, and we've got what we call micro strain, which is the amount of um, tension that goes through the, this is the front of the cannon bone in the horse. And when we look at this and the idea uh, what a horse wants to try and achieve is in this blue zone in the middle here. So this is the theory of the mechanostat. And it basically says that the horse tries to minimize the amount of strain that occurs on the bone. So it occurs at a certain, within a certain range. And so if it's exposed to more work, it makes the bone stronger. And if it's exposed to less work, it makes the bone basically in essence a little bit weaker because it doesn't want to spend extra energy making the bone stronger than it has to be. Now, when we talk about foals and play and stimulatory activity here, we can see that once you get above 10 meters per second, which is once we're out of that lovely little gentle canter, but the rapid acceleration and deceleration, we can see that we're outside, we're in what we call the zone for um, the stimulatory zone. So we're above 2,500 microstrains. And so that basically is a signal for the bone to say, oh, we're going to expect some serious load, so we have to remodel so that we can tolerate and minimize the amount of strain so that we're, we're working basically in a, in a safe, safe region. And I've got a little dotted black line there at 14 meters per second, and we use that when we talk about epidemiology and we talk about injury, but we use 14 meters per second as our threshold for racehorses to be galloping. And it looks like when we will show you some data from um, thoroughbreds, but that is the, the stimulus for a much greater bone response once you exceed 14 meters per second. So even within that zone, there appears to be a very dramatic difference between work below 14 meters per second and those above 14 meters per second. So it's, it's quite a, a clever and very, I guess you'd say almost an elegant system that has this feedback, which is always trying to keep the bone and the, the tissue in the body within that safety zone, um, but not trying to do too much, just enough to be able to cope with what's happening and not waste additional energy on something that isn't required. Now, um, the, we talk about, you know, the idea of these, this high speed activity stimulating bone. And this is some lovely data from um, Pete Brahma when he looked at the loads. This is the load, what we're looking at here is the fetlock joint. And what Pete did is he, he took a, a cadaver, what we call a cadaver limb, and he loaded it according to the different loads that are experienced when we have, if we start at the top there, that's a horse standing still, walking, trotting, cantering, and galloping. And when we look at the, um, the, the joints in a young foal, horses are born with what we call a blank joint. So the cartilage in the joint is, is, is homogeneous, it's all the same, and it's basically sitting there waiting to be told 
what loads it's going to be exposed to. So if the foal is just reared in an environment where it never gets to gallop and never gets to have those osteoinductive um, play activities, high speed acceleration and deceleration, then the cartilage is never primed. It doesn't know that it's going to experience those loads. So then when you take the animal into sport, the cartilage has not been prepared. Now the reason we get quite worried about cartilage is cartilage is perhaps, we've got a really small window for setting up quality cartilage. And then after that, cartilage is one of these uh, materials. We, we talk about the turnover life in cartilage and the turnover life in cartilage, which is the term which theoretically a horse could replace the cartilage within a joint, um, is 150 years. So it gives you an idea of how slowly cartilage turnover is. Basically what we're trying to look at with cartilage is set it up, develop it as well as we can, and then try and minimize um, any trauma to it because it's basically, it doesn't have the capacity to regenerate rapidly. It's not like bone or like muscle. Now, if we have a look at um, that image that we had there, which I said was when the horse was standing still, when the Dutch did a lovely experiment, which is called the Exoc experiment, and they reared horses at pasture, and then they reared horses in what they had as a conventional stall environment, when they looked at the cartilage in the fetlock joint in the animals that had been reared at weaning in the conventional Dutch system, which was a loose stall, the cartilage looked pretty much what we were seeing um, with this image here. So it was all the same, it didn't have any variation in it, and the, the horses, had, because they'd never had the, the loads, the cartilage hadn't bothered to respond. So it was incapable of tolerating high speed loads. When they looked at the cartilage in the foals that had been reared at pasture, it was what we saw down here. It had what we called beautiful, this beautiful heterogeneity, the, the variation in the biochemical composition, which meant that it could recognize that there were different sites on that joint that were going to be loaded at high, high rates and those at low rates, and it had developed appropriately. And so what we're looking at here is if we imagine a fetlock joint, this is the, um, the, the long past and bone as it touches the, um, the, the cannon bone. And so here is the front of the joint. And if we talk about racehorses, during stance phase, when the, um, the fetlock is at maximum flexion, this is where this front part of the long past and bone actually compresses up and against the cannon bone. So you can see here that these animals, have had, if, if they're exposed and allowed to exercise, the cartilage can respond, the bone underneath it can respond, and it's able to tolerate that. So in theory, these animals are able to tolerate those loads. If we hadn't provided that exercise, it would come as a major shock to them. And um, then we would start seeing things like um, cartilage shearing, and uh, we talk about things like, like carpal chips, which carpal chips occur in this very region here. So it starts to give us a little bit of an idea of, ah, this is some beautiful data showing variation and pressure, um, and why perhaps we need to have these foals able to exercise. So Chris, do you find more, I guess, if you looked at an athletic horse or galloper thoroughbred, for instance, do they find more issues with that cartilage at the front of that, of the joint? Or is that common or is it just all over the place? No, so yeah, we, we do see some some tears and some some loss at the front there. The major problem for us in gallopers is at the back of the cannon bone, and that's because we talk about the fetlock joint acting as a nutcracker action. So as the fetlock flexes, what happens is the um, the the sesamoids, which which are the bones at the back, which the um, the flexor tendons run over the back, they get pushed into the back of um, the cannon bone. And this creates a huge amount of compression. We have a problem in gallopers called uh, palmar osteochondral disease. And that really um, is a reflection of the amount of compression that goes in when you're at maximum stance phase. Um, and again, that's a, another example of, I don't have any images here, but um, when we, we look at what we did with the, the Gexa foals, we looked at the cartilage in that site and we were able to um, upregulate the chondrocytes at that site. So for, for gallopers, yes, we do see on P1 that this is a problem, but the major problem is really at the palmer, the back of the, um, the, the, the cannon bone where the sesamoids impinge. 
Now, um, this is a, an, an image to sort of show you that it's not just cartilage that really uh, responds dynamically to, to loading, but um, the idea of bone. So what we've done here is we've taken a CT scan, and this is some work that we did uh, quite a few years ago where we, uh, we, we bought a portable CT scanner and we took it out in the field and we, we followed prospectively a, a whole cohort of uh, thoroughbred foals that were born. And what we have there where it's labeled a four day old foal is if you can imagine we've taken a scan, so we've gone across the fetlock joint. And what we have here is this is the front of the fetlock, this is the back of the fetlock, and these are these bones I was talking about, which are the sesamoids. So the tendons run over the back, and these sesamoids there are basically there to try and increase the, the work and the efficiency of the tendons. But a drawback of that is that they get compressed into the back of um, the cannon bone here in, in the back of this, the epiphysis or the palmar aspect. Now, when we look at a CT scan, we often look and we want to see bright yellow or white to tell us that there's a lot of calcium there and there's a lot of bone mineral density. And what we can see in this four day old foal is if we go and we've gone right through at the, um, what we call the epiphysis, so that's the, the bent bit at the bottom of the cannon bone where the joint articulates, we can see here it's got some calcium, but it's actually really waiting to be told what is going to happen. So as a four day old foal, that's very plastic and, and is susceptible, or I guess it's, it's, it's waiting to be primed to be told what is going to happen and what needs to occur. And to give you an idea of how much response actually can occur is the image I've got here, which is a two-year-old racehorse, which was from another study, is this is a horse that had only galloped four or five times. And what we can see is it's exactly the same, same, <coughs> pardon me, exactly the same slice. I've just trimmed it up a bit because it was um, a slightly larger image. So we've just got, so we're looking at across the, um, the bottom of the cannon bone. And what we can see here is this is the front uh, um, of the cannon bone, right through the, the fetlock joint. We've got the seismoids at the back here. And what we can see here is this lovely pattern of what we call sclerosis, where the bone has remodeled and become, has increased in density because this is where the seismoids, we talk about the nutcracker action, where the seismoids, what we call impinge on the back here. So you can see that bone isn't like a brick, it's not all the same. It is quite diverse. The density and the architecture in it depends on the loads at each site. So we can see here's where we were talking about where that load is um, on the, the dorsal aspect on the front where P1 impinges against the cannon bone. And here we can see at the back where the seismoids are hitting. So we've got these very focal areas of response and then the rest of it has responded to allow that to, um, to tolerate the load but to be the best functional unit that it can be. So it's, it's lovely sort of data showing that with only six, six um, gallop training days, that the bone has responded so dynamically and so, um, so rapidly to tolerate the loads that it's exposed to. And I see, Chris, on that, there is some blue bits. So there's some soft bone on the side of the, of the joint as well. Yes, so, so some of that, the, the blue on the outside, we can see is, is a layer of cartilage. And part of what we have here is if we look at, we've got a little bit of density here, but not quite so dense on uh, this aspect. And part of it is, if we think about the function of this joint, so we've got uh, the cannon bone, which has condyles and the, the, the sagittal ridge, and it sits inside a little groove on um, the long piston bone. And, and what has to happen there is, if, if you increase density too much, it becomes really robust, but it becomes quite brittle. So you've got to have a structure that actually is strong in the right places, but is still pliable and is capable of a little bit of yield um, where required. And so what you can see is actually the condyles, we have this ability for a little bit of yield, where as it, uh, it's at maximum stance, and then the condyles just flex just a fraction on the sides there. So it's, it's not like... Um, like a bungee cord, but it's this very subtle tolerance of load. So it's, it's what we call an anxiotrophic material in that it's, it's different. The way it responds to load is different in each direction, and its material properties are different depending on which direction you look at it and, and the way that the load is applied. So it's a, a really, it's, it's, it's quite a lovely example of how rapidly a horse responds to um, the load cycles that it's exposed to. 